this arrival created in our secluded quarters quite a sensation. The cases remained in the hall, and the messenger was taken charge of by the servants till he had eaten his supper. Then, with assistance and armed with hammer, ripping, chisel, and turn screw, he met us in the hall where we had assembled to witness the unpacking of the cases. Carmilla sat looking listlessly on while one after the other the old pictures, nearly all portraits which had undergone the process of renovation, were brought to light. My mother was of an old Hungarian family, and most of these pictures, which were about to be restored to their places, had come to us through her. My father had a list in his hand from which he read as the artist rummaged out the corresponding numbers. I don't know what the pictures were very good, but they were undoubtedly very old and some of them very curious also. They had for the most part the merit of being now seen by me, I may say, for the first time, but the smoke and dust of time had all but obliterated them. There is a picture that I have not seen yet said my father. In one corner at the top of it is the name, as well as I could read, Marcia Karnstein, and the date 1698, and I'm curious to see how it has turned out. I remembered it. It was a small picture, about a foot and a half high, and nearly square without a frame, but it was so blackened by age that I could not make it out. The artist now produced it with evident pride. It was quite beautiful. It was startling. It seemed to live. It was the effigy of Carmilla. Carmilla, dear, here is an absolute miracle. Here you are, living, smiling, ready to speak in this picture. Isn't it beautiful, Papa? And see, even the little mole on her throat. My father laughed and said, certainly, it is a wonderful likeness. But he looked away, and to my surprise seemed but little struck by it. I went on talking to the picture cleaner, who was also something of an artist, and discoursed with intelligence about the portraits of other works, which his art had just brought into light and color. While I was more and more lost in wonder, the more I looked at the picture. Will you let me hang this picture in my room, Papa? I asked. Oh, she's so me. She's like, oh my god. This portrait looks just like my girlfriend. Let me put it in my room. <laughs>
she drew her arm closer about my waist and let her pretty head sink upon my shoulder. How romantic you are, Camilla, I said. Whenever you tell me your story, it will be made up chiefly of, of some one great romance. She kissed me silently. Thank you. 
on smiling but made no answer, only continued to smile at me. You won't answer that, I said. You can't answer pleasantly, I ought not to have asked you. You are quite right to ask me that, or anything. You do not know how dear you are to me, or you could not think any confidence too great to look for. But I am under vows, no none half so awfully, and I dare not tell my story yet, even to you. The time is very near when you shall know everything. You will think me cruel, very selfish, but love is always selfish. The more ardent, the more selfish. How jealous I am, you cannot know. You must come with me, loving me to death, or else hate me and still come with me, and hating me through death and after. There's no such word as indifference in my apathetic nature. Now, Camilla, you're going to talk your wild nonsense again, I said hastily. Now, I, silly little fool as I am, and full of whims and fancies for your sake, I'll take a sage. Were you ever at a ball? No, how you do run on. What is it like? How charming you must be. I almost forgot. It is years ago. I laughed. You are not so old. Your first ball can hardly be forgotten yet. <laughs> okay, so I have like kind of so lazy. How can I get up just now and lie? 
saw the same female figure walking down the lime tree avenue. So he well might, as long as there are cows to milk in the river field, said madame. I dare say, but Martin chooses to be frightened, and never did I see a fool more frightened. You must say not a word about it to Carmilla, because she can see down that walk from her room window, I interpose, and she is, if possible, a greater coward than I. <laughs> Certainly, you don't suppose that you 
orgasms of languid adoration more frequent. She used to gloat on me with increasing ardor. The more my strength and spirits waned, this always shocked me like a momentary glare of insanity. Without knowing it, I was now in a pretty advanced stage of the strangest illness under which mortal ever suffered. There was an unaccountable fascination in its earlier symptoms that more than reconciled me to the incapacitating effect of that stage of the malady. This fascination increased for a time until it reached a certain point, which gradually a sense of horrible mingled itself with a deepening, as you shall hear, until it discolored and perverted the whole state of my life. The first change I experienced was rather agreeable. It was very near the turning point from which began the descent of Avernus. Certain vague and strange sensations visited me in my sleep. The prevailing one was of that pleasant, peculiar cold thrill which we feel in bathing when we move against the current of a river. This was soon accompanied by dreams that seemed interminable and were so vague that I could never recollect their scenery and persons or any unconnected portion of their action. But they left an awful impression and a sense of exhaustion, as if I'd passed through a long period of great mental exertion and danger. After all these dreams, there remained, on waking, a remembrance of having been in a place very nearly dark, and of having spoken to people whom I could not see, and especially one clear voice of a female's, very deep, that spoke as if at a distance, slowly, and producing away the same sensation of indescribable solemnity. Sometimes there came a sensation as if a hand was drawn softly along my cheek and neck. Sometimes it was as if warm lips kissed me, and low and longer and longer and more lovingly as they reached my throat. But there the caress fixed itself. My heart beat faster, my breathing rose and fell rapidly, and full drawn. A sobbing that rose into a sense of strangulation supervened and turned into a dreadful convulsion in which my senses left me and I became unconscious. It was now three weeks into the commencement of this unaccountable state. My sufferings had during the last week told upon my appearance. I had grown pale, my eyes were dilated and darkened underneath, and a languor which I had long felt began to display itself in my countenance. My father asked me often whether I was ill, but with an obstinacy which now seems to me unaccountable. I persisted in assuring him that I was quite well. Servants, however, 
soon came running up the stairs. I had gone on my dressing gown and slippers meanwhile, and my companions were already similarly furnished. Recognizing the voices of the, the voices of the servants on the lobby, we sailed out together. And having renewed as fruitlessly our summons at Cremola's door, I ordered the men to force the lock. They did so, and we stood holding our night our lights aloft in the doorway, and so stared into the room. We called her by name, but there was still no reply. We looked around the room. Everything was undisturbed. It was exactly in the state in which I had left it on bidding her good night. Bacramilla was gone. I'm sorry, I don't believe anyone a cliffhanger with this one. <laughs> that, I think it was chapter 5, was like extremely short, so good thing we were able to fit in um, an extra chapter. Um, although I would like to try to do even more than that. Maybe do four chapters in a video, if they're not too long. I don't want it to be, um, you know, almost an hour.
these chapters. Exactly. 